Everywhere I speak, uh, the weather is horrible, so uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna have to get a new profession. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, Cindy Canary, and the Committee for Economic Development, Charlie Cobb, and Justice at Stake, and Burt Brandenburg. I appreciate the marks, and, and thank you all for having me here today to participate in this dis uh, distinguished panel. Um, it's, a, it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, I, I want to take just one second to introduce my wife, Kathy, who is with me and has been with me through this long ordeal all these years. And thank you. And my daughter, Preston, who is here today. And Preston is 13 years old, and she was born exactly one week to the day that my legal ordeal started. So this is all she's ever known. So Preston, thank you for coming today. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution grants every citizen the right to due process of the law, a fair trial in a fair tribunal. It doesn't say some citizens or citizens with lots of money or citizens who support special interest groups that are spending millions on judicial elections. It says every citizen. Imagine that for almost 13 years, you've been involved in a court battle with one of the nation's largest coal companies whose fraudulent acts and tortious interference led to the destruction of your company. A company that took 10 years to build and provided hundreds of jobs to an area of the country that sorely needed them. After years of delays, motions, pretrial hearings, depositions, and a trial that lasted over seven weeks in which a jury of your peers found in your favor, you were finally sitting in front of the West Virginia Supreme Court hoping that after all these years, justice will finally be served. Now imagine looking up and sitting on the bench is a justice that has been the beneficiary of one individual's $3 million spending spree in his election just a few years before. That individual was the CEO of the coal company that you have battled for those last 13 years. During the hearing, that justice never says a word. He never asks a question. When it comes time for the oral arguments, your attorney stands and starts to speak. And as he does, another of the justices rises from his chair and proceeds to leave the bench. He will not return to the bench until your attorneys have concluded their arguments. Later that night, that justice and the CEO exchange personal emails. Three months later, photographs are made public of the CEO and justice vacationing together on the French Riviera while your case is pending before the court. Now, I know that sounds like something out of a John Grisham novel that Bert just spoke about. But this is, in fact, reality. This is exactly what happened to me. And I'm here to tell you the feeling I had as I watched and listened to the oral arguments that day can only be, be described in one word, sickening. It's a feeling that no citizen in this country should ever have to endure in any court in this country. The court voted 3-2 to reverse the lower court's decision in our case. It used a form selection clause in a coal supply contract that the defendant was not a party to, had tortiously interfered with, and never abided by in good faith as the grounds to reverse. I waited nine years to have my case against Massey Energy heard before the West Virginia Supreme Court. And before my attorneys even stood up to make their oral arguments, I knew that two of the five justices had already made up their minds. The actions of Chief Justice Robin Davis that day made it clear where the third vote would come from. She completely ignored the briefs that had been filed by the parties and instead focused her questions on forum selection, an issue so insignificant to the appellant's argument that they devoted one entire sentence to the subject in the 90-page appeal brief that Massey filed with the court. Now, although bitterly disappointed, None of us were surprised when the court overturned the jury's decision. The three justices who made up the majority were Justice Brent Benjamin, 
the recipient of Massey CEO's, uh, Massey's CEO Don Blankenship's personal $3 million spending spree in his election, election bid, Justice Spike Maynard, who accompanied Blankenship on vacation to Monaco, and Chief Justice Davis, who in violation of the Code of Judicial Conduct was publicly supporting Justice Maynard's re-election campaign. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice Davis said the following, quote, we wish to make it perfectly clear that the facts of this case demonstrate that Massey's conduct warranted the type of judgment rendered in this case. However, no matter how sympathetic the facts are or how egregious the conduct, we simply cannot compromise the law in order to reach a result that clearly appeared to be justified." Unquote. In other words, the jury got it right. The majority then proceeded to change the court's standard for review on a motion to dismiss for improper venue from an abuse of discretion standard to a de novo standard of review by the Supreme Court. By retroactively applying this new standard, the court reversed the lower court's de denial of the defendant's motion to dismiss, which had been ruled on seven years prior to the Supreme Court hearing this case. They then turned their attention to the forum selection laws that had been on the books in West Virginia for nearly 100 years. They threw those out and authored eight new forum selection laws. Again, the court applied these new laws retroactively to our case. It was the first time in West Virginia's 147-year history that forum selection had been used to overturn a jury verdict. Justice Margaret Workman, in her dissent of the opinion, said, quote, remarkably, in every instance that existing law and long-standing precedent took, stood in the way of the result reached by the majority, it simply altered the law accordingly, unquote. Now, we went through this same song and dance in West Virginia Supreme Court two more times and with the same results. Somewhat incredibly, our second appearance in the court was in front of a panel of justices justices that included Justice Brent Benjamin, who was acting as Chief Justice, and two replacement justices appointed by none other than himself. This was after we had asked twice for Justice Benjamin to disqualify himself from the proceedings. Justice Benjamin's failure to recuse himself led, ultimately led to Caperton v. Massey going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court where it became a landmark decision that has forever changed the way campaign contributions affect judicial recusals. And although Caperton was a tremendous victory, it had little or no bearing on the outcome of my case. And the reason it didn't was because the damage had already been done to the West Virginia court. One man had succeeded in tainting the court. Justice Larry Starcher said it best when he said that Blankenship had created a cancer in the court. And that cancer was created when big money was introduced into Justice Benjamin's campaign by what the new politics report issued by Justice at stake last year refers to as super spenders. Now let's be clear, and I think we all know this. Don Blankenship did not spend $3 million of his own money because he wanted a fair and balanced court. He did it to influence a vote that ultimately led to his company essentially being granted a $75 million get out of jail free card. And this is what makes the issue of big money influencing judicial elections so difficult for the ordinary citizen, the reasonable person. It appears that justice is indeed for sale. Even with Blankenship's outrageous spending on Justice Benjamin's campaign, a fair and impartial court would have been, had a much better chance of occurring in my case if West Virginia had adopted judicial disqualification standards such as those recommended by the Brennan Center for Justice in a report issued this past February called Promoting Fair and Impartial Courts Through Recusal Reform. In the report, they urge that states adopt two fundamental changes to their recusal rules, which I wholly endorse. One is that states should require that all recusal motions be reviewed by neutral judges so the judge in question does not have final say in his or her disqualification. The second is the states should adopt, also adopt rules stating a judge's impartiality may be questioned with respect to judicial campaign spending by parties to litigation 
and their attorneys, and that those donations may represent grounds for disqualification. Now, I'm here today not because I'm a legal scholar, nor one of the leading appellate attorneys in the country. I am here because I am a citizen who has experienced firsthand the devastation and destruction that big money campaign donations are causing in judicial elections and ultimately in our courts. Through my unique experience, it is my opinion that by adopting these rules, the role of large campaign contributions creating an appearance of probability of bias in our courts will diminish substantially, and states adopting these rules will go a long way toward instilling public confidence in our courts. Thank you all.